or now formally called to order. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Lenny Mendoza, a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, a Director Emeritus at McKinsey and & Company, and your moderator for tonight's program. We're going to have a very interesting conversation that could not be more timely this evening. And it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest, my friend Max Steyer, the founding president and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service. I'm going to do a little bit more formal introduction to Max, and then I want to say some things about him privately before we get going. Um, the peaceful transition of power has, of course, been a hallmark of our democracy. But new presidents consistently fail to get their new administrations up and running quickly and effectively. Max Steyer has been leading a comprehensive initiative to reform the system and advise both the outgoing administration and the incoming transition teams. And as you all know, we're witnessing a new administration trying to rapidly figure out its cabinet and staff members and what to do as they take reins of this government. And you're about to get a candid insider's perspective on the most complex takeover in the world and a case study in changing how Washington works. Under Max's leadership, the Partnership for Public Service has been widely praised as a first-class nonprofit organization and thought leader on government management issues. In 2015, the partnership launched the Center for the Presidential Transition, a first-of-its-kind effort to ensure the smoothest transition of power yet by working with the campaign teams, federal agencies, and the outgoing administration. Max himself has worked previously in all three branches of the federal government, having served on the personal staff of U.S. Representative Jim Leach. He clerked for Chief Judge James Oakes of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and clerked for Justice David Souter of the Supreme Court. Most recently, he was Deputy General Counsel in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. He's a graduate of Yale College, and he thought better and came to Stanford for law school. <laughs> um, so more personally, I've, I've known Max for several years and had a chance to observe what he's been doing in Washington, and he is the best kept problem-solving secret in Washington. People focus a lot on politics and policy. Few people focus on how government actually works and do it in a nonpartisan, really effective way on behalf of citizens. And Max and the Partnership for Public Service is at the forefront of that, and anyone who's in Washington trying to get a counsel on how to make Washington work turns to Max. So please join me in giving a warm Commonwealth Club welcome to Max Steyer. It's all downhill after that introduction. <laughs> like, uh... All right, so let, let me start the conversation with, um, can you just give me a very short version of why you do this? How did you get into this? And what's, what is this thing called the Partnership for Public Service? Short is tricky on that. But before I get there, I want to thank you, Lenny, for being an extraordinary rabbi coming through Silicon Valley and helping uh, the partnership and me understand this environment and connect to so many great people. And thank you for all your service in so many ways. So he's the one who really deserves a round of applause. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, so to, to, your, to your question and, and the multi parts of it, uh, first with the Partnership for Public Services, as, as you stated, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Our goal is very straightforward, and that is to make the federal government a more effective institution. And we think about uh, one of the great strengths of our country is the breadth and, and capability of the nonprofit sector. And there literally are hundreds of thousands of nonprofits focused on every issue of public interest, except for making the government better at doing all of that. And our notion is that, again, as Lenny had stated, everyone focuses on policy when thinking about the government. And yet, if you don't have effective execution, your policy is meaningless. And we live in an age in which our government is simply not keeping up with the world around it. So the partnership is about trying to make the government run better. You can want big or small government, and that's a legitimate you know, debate. But you have to want government to do well whatever it's supposed to do. And so that's fundamentally what we're about as an organization. How I came to this 15 years ago is a totally different story, and someday I'm happy to tell it, but I think there are better things to talk about okay. now. All right, great. So there's a whole lot of things that the partnership does, including really helping government understand how its employees are feeling about their jobs. Yes. But tonight we want to talk about 
a relatively new effort that's really timely around your work with the presidential transition. Um, the Atlantic Magazine did a story on this and titled the story, The Most Important Takeover of Any Organization in History. I think that's actually pretty accurate. I agree. So give us a little bit of sense of what you're doing and what, when we talk about, it's not really takeover in a hostile sense, although I guess in some ways we could talk about that, but in terms of how it actually works, what, what are you doing? How's that, what is a transition of, of leadership? In, sure, in and so again, as children, at least uh, I was taught, the peaceful transfer of power is the hallmark of our democracy. You know, we hear about it being peaceful, but no one tells you it's actually ugly. And the reality is that there's been no transition that has occurred effectively in the past. And that was relatively okay until we moved into the post 9-11 world. And so uh, transition is actually the point of maximum vulnerability for our country. Uh, it's a handoff of power from one group to another. The scope is phenomenally large. So we have a $4 trillion government. There are 4 million people that work in it when you count the military. There are 4,000 political appointees that the new president has to put into place. 1,100 of those have to be Senate confirmed. No other democracy on the planet has anywhere close to the number of political appointees that we do. And, and I would argue that it's a vestige of the spoil system and there are way too many of them, but it's what we got. And it typically takes new administrations over a year to get their core leadership teams in place. So to make this very concrete, you roll the tape back to the last transition eight years ago, uh, you had obviously the most substantial financial crisis that we've seen in our country since the Depression. The Department of Treasury, obviously critical you know, entity in trying to address that. We had Tim Geithner nominated by uh, then President-elect Obama, and he got uh, confirmed by the Senate in early February. The second person to come into the Treasury Department in a confirmed position came in in May. And on average, what we've seen is literally two months between when the first person and the second person gets confirmed. So transitions are really about the new president getting ready to take over the government and the goal ought to be to be ready on day one. Our proposition is ready means to have your core leadership team on the field at game time, that's January 20th, making sure that you actually have a management agenda, not just a policy agenda, because again, your ideas are only as good as your ability to get them done, and to have begun the process of building the critical relationships that you need in order to be able to govern effectively. And no president has succeeded in doing that well to date. And it's a, both a huge risk for us as a, as a, as a nation, as well as uh, it diminishes the ability of our government, frankly, to perform in the way that we need it to. So we're focused on trying to improve that process. Bizarrely, to my knowledge, no one has ever done this before. Fundamental process, it's been Groundhog Day. Every new administration comes forward, they start from scratch. And you, 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 you brought one, I brought one, but this is the first ever transition guidebook. And uh, we have you know, the Obama documents, the Romney documents, we have commitments from the Trump uh, and the Clinton teams to give us all their material. The idea really is to create a learning system. And that in the broadest sense is what we're trying to do with this project. Um, so the first time you told me this, I thought that can't be true. It's not like we don't have a transition every four or at most eight years. Right. People are, are literally had not had a playbook about how to do it. It's bizarre. And I don't have a, I have some sort of ideas about why it's, not, it's been the case. Part of it is that uh, you have, um, these are private activities. So you obviously have a system of presidential libraries. They don't capture this information. This is only... Um, this is fall if you want if you wanted historically to get transition information, you had to ask people who had done it before to go into their garage or behind their desk and pull out the old box of a bunch of documents. So at best, you had oral history being transferred and not actually uh, tools, et cetera. Now, it's not only about, as I said before, no one's done this right. So collecting all the documents from the past doesn't get you all the way there. Um, one of the things we've done is we've, work to change the legal environments. So we've actually gotten three laws passed that have improved the process of transitions, and I can talk further about that if, if there's interest. Uh, and we've built a lot of tools uh, to help the new teams coming in. And in part, it's because the task is so phenomenally large that even doing everything right, it's impossible to get this job done perfectly. And you can't create all the information you need within the time horizon that you have. So you think about it, just as an anecdote, the CEO of Aetna was describing to me 
He's obviously involved in a very large takeover. Uh, it's large in the corporate sense, but puny uh, in the context of, of the federal government takeover. He's been at the work for over a year. He's got 3,000 uh, people who are specialists on takeovers who are working on this. You know, you're, you're, you're from the preeminent, you know, McKinsey firm. It's a, it's a massive industry that supports this in the private sector, and there's no industry that's actually done any work associated with this in the, in the public sector at the federal level. So um, you mentioned that there have been some laws passed that changed a little bit how this works. So I want to get into the weeds just for a minute. How normally did this happen? So if someone gets elected on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Right. And then they're inaugurated January 20th. Right. When's the tra how does that transition happen? So historically, uh, you're exactly right. Transition was always viewed as the you know, minute you stop celebrating after election to the minute you swear that you're going to uphold the Constitution on January 20th. And that's typically 70 some odd days. So clearly not enough to do everything that you got to get done. Campaigns have been loath historically to actually do earlier transition planning because the job number one of any campaign is to win. And anything that might interfere with winning is something you're not going to do. And not only was transition planning viewed as a distraction, it was viewed as a political weakness because campaigns were concerned that they would be accused of being presumptuous, of measuring the drapes. And these accusations actually flew whenever anyone learned that someone was doing transition planning. And so our concept was, why don't we create a safe space to enable the campaigns to do what they should be doing? So the first law we got passed did a bunch of things, but the most important thing that it did was it moved the date of support that the federal government gave for transition planning from where it had been, which was right after the election, to after the convention. And that broke things open. So that passed in 2010. The first team that had the benefit of that was the Romney Readiness Project. They came out publicly, aggressively, and, and to this date, I would say, for pre-election planning, they've been the gold standard. And we actually started them on their planning in May of 2008, uh, I'm sorry, 2012, just like we started the Trump and Clinton teams in their transition work in actually April of this past year. And uh, one of the things we haven't touched on, which I am motivated by, is that this is truly nonpartisan space. And so we have worked with the Clinton and Trump teams pre-election together. Um, and at one point in April, we actually had representatives of the Cruz campaign, the Casey campaign, uh, the Trump campaign, the Sanders campaign, the Clinton campaign. We had Mike Levitt from the Romney Readiness Project. We had Josh Bolton, the former White House chief of staff from Bush administration, folks from the Obama White House in one room, a lot smaller than this one here. Uh, and, you know, as one member of the group said, everyone left their swords at the door. And it was a phenomenally collaborative, cooperative conversation, despite the fact that outside that room, it was war. And everyone understood that no matter who wins, we collectively, we Americans, have to be committed to this process working right. The, the, the metaphor for me that captured this most effectively is thinking about, the, you know, in essence, the president-elect is the pilot on the plane we're flying in right now. And you know, I don't want that pilot I don't wish that pilot ill. I wish that pilot to be a successful pilot because it, it, it's, it's about all of our welfare. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question before we get into the specifics of where we are now and then we'll open it up for questions right. shortly. But um, I cannot imagine that room that you just described yeah. with at that moment in time given what was going on in the campaign. I couldn't imagine it beforehand either. So. <laughs> but for, for those of yeah. us who don't, live and breathe what actually goes on inside of government as opposed yeah. to reading about it in the newspapers yeah. or watching a campaign. What could they be talking about that would get them in the same room and actually cooperate? What do yeah. you, what, when you're talking about transition, what are they actually doing? Right. So, I mean, it's, it's really laying out the requirements of success. And I mentioned earlier that one of the big changes we had is we lengthened the runway that, that folks had to actually prepare. Because if you only have 70, you know, in this instance, 73 days, there's no way that you can be ready. And, um, but the second piece is to understand what your goals need to be and then how do you need to organize towards them. So again, in the past, uh, to my mind, the personnel piece is the most important. Uh, and it, new administrations have tried to beat the last person. And beating the last person typically means getting your cabinet in place slightly earlier than the other folks did. And that's not good enough when you think about it. And so our proposition is you actually need to have your top 100 people confirmed, 
There are, in fact, about 450 core people that you need to run the government at the, con at the Senate confirmation level and your White House ready. So what we did in the room is to lay out the tracks of work that needs to be done. So there's a big piece around personnel. There's a big piece around policy implementation. And then there's a set of supporting activities. So as an example, a new president has basically one month before, uh, at, rather after they're inaugurated, to present their budget. If you don't begin the process of creating that budget during that transition period, you're toast. You know, the budget is actually what's going to provide you the support that you need for any policy that you want. And it's going to be going forward, in essence, for the next 18 months. So the conversation is really about, that we had then and that has continued on, uh, is really about how to understand the process, how to organize towards it, um, and allowing people to have the tools that they need to actually be successful in doing this. And we're still learning uh, about how to do this right. And, and, and this process has identified a bunch of other places where there are weaknesses. Uh, but, um, but, you know, again, in a world in which they had nothing, they actually looked at what we had and said, that's helpful. So OK. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, let's talk about the transition that we're in the, in the middle of now. Right. So you had the conventions, yes. and then both campaigns after they accepted the nomination got a transition team up and running. They, and they actually had teams pre-convention started, but what they got after the convention is the, the governmental support. So they got office space. They were actually in the same, same building at 1717 Pennsylvania with inhaling distance of the White House. They shared an elevator bank. Uh, and, and honestly, again, not only did we have that session, but we had you know, like multiple other sessions again with them together, and it worked great. But... Um, so it's really post-convention that the pace picks up a lot. The team grows. They're given the office space, the computers. And again, in today's age, when you think about the cyber vulnerabilities, that also becomes increasingly important, too. OK, so um, what was it like working with the Clinton transition team? And what was it like working with the Trump transition teams? So um, I think, as I stated earlier, both were highly committed to the goals of the exercise. And uh, a lot of times I've gotten questions about, well, does this make sense? What happens if you lose? Isn't that wasteful? And part of what we're trying to communicate to people is that, in fact, it's the reverse of wasteful. Any candidate that doesn't do this preparation shouldn't ever be elected. Because uh, winning is not what this is about. It's about governing. And you cannot be ready to govern if you don't do this work. People don't ask the question to the loser, why did you run a campaign? And people ought to assume that if you're willing to run a campaign, you have to be willing to do the work necessary to be ready to actually run the government. Uh, so to answer your question, there's not a lot of difference. The, they, they, were not, they were not competing against each other in this context. They were competing against the clock and the requirements of transition planning. And they learned together, and they both, I think, appropriately understood the magnitude uh, of, the, of the task, and it is overwhelming. So again, a quick footnote about how amazing this, 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 this responsibility is. I mentioned earlier that Mike Levitt probably set at the Romney Readiness Project in 2012 the, the gold standard for pre-election planning. And he describes it. This is a man who was a three-term governor of Utah. Uh, he was a cabinet secretary twice over, ran EPA, HHS. He says that running the transition for Mitt Romney, and not even the post-election piece, the pre-election piece, was the hardest thing and the most rewarding thing that he ever had done. Okay. It, is, it is incredibly challenging. Uh, again, because you're trying to, with limited resources, very limited time, and limited knowledge, create a new government. And that's, uh, you know, challenging. That's uh, high praise from a man who's generally regarded as one of the best executives in government. Absolutely, absolutely, and it is, it is striking. And actually, we started our session with him leading off because, and, that, and, and what's, what's also wonderful about this is everyone has been willing to give their knowledge, their time, on a pro bono basis to help this, this, this whole effort. And I can't think of anyone who said no to us. You know, obviously, sometimes you get conflicts, you know, scheduling issues, but everyone has been willing to help in this process. And I think it's, it's, it's promising, it's encouraging, it's indicative of the fact that, that even in these challenging times, there still is a common commitment to 
um, the strength of our country and the importance of working together on issues of, of common need. Okay. So um, obviously on 11-9 we had a winner and there is now a president-elect who is um, working this transition. Yes. Um, he also, after being elected, changed out his transition team. Yes. Well, changed out the leadership in the transition okay. team. Yes. So t tell, us yes. What, tell us what happened and what that's like. Sure. So um, I will say Chris Christie, who is the, you know, early on was named the transition lead for, for um, then-candidate uh, Donald Trump. Um, he had an executive director, uh, Rich Bagger, who a uh, very accomplished gentleman who currently works for Celgene. And they did a very strong job in building the pre-election transition effort. And uh, as we all saw in the news, uh, after the election, um, Chris Christie was moved out of the lead of the transition effort, and as was Rich Bagger. Uh, the operation that they built is still extant and still moving forward, and it has only grown um, as it needed to. Uh, so um, it's certainly the case, and again, you'd ask the question about what it was like to work with the Clinton team versus the Trump team, there are some salient differences. I mean, you have, you know, in one instance, uh, a candidate who had very deep governmental knowledge and the people around her knew the government very well. And in the other instance with President-elect Trump, uh, he's coming from the outside, doesn't have, you know, at all the traditional connections to government that any other president-elect has ever had in our history that, that I can think of. Um, so it's a, it's a novel situation. And the complexity is quite extraordinary. So um, when he changed out Chris Christie and Mike Pence became the leader of the transition effort, that definitely you know, slowed things down. Um, and we are seeing, obviously, right now, a lot of discussion about the cabinet choices that, that President Trump is making. I think it's important for people, again, to focus on the right side of the telescope. I think there's a tendency to look through the wrong side. And, and there's a lot of uh, focus on the individuals that are being called out right now. And I would just um, uh, advocate for remembering what the goal is. The goal is not to name or to designate a set of nominees for the cabinet. The goal is to get your leadership team on the field at scale in real time. And that requires not just a single individual making picks, but a broader operation working efficiently. And I think it's still too early to tell whether Trump succeeds in doing that more important, larger piece. Um, but it, it's vital that the public, that the media understand what the objectives need to be and what, how success should actually be uh, judged. And it is a, as I said earlier, no one has done it right so far. One can argue, well, is it fair to you know, judge a president that, uh, on these standards if no one else has met them before? And I think the answer is yes because this is what we need to get done in today's world. Even if it was at least acceptable in the past, it shouldn't be today, not with the risks that we have, not with the difficulties that we face as a nation, and not with which the speed of challenge arises in today's world. And just as a side note, I mentioned, we're not about transitions as qua transitions. We're focused on transitions because they're the starting point for our government we need to be concerned not about uh, the transition. We need to be concerned about whether government is keeping up with the world around us. And it all begins at the beginning. If you begin poorly in the start, you're playing catch up the entire time. And this is a race where you can't catch up. So you got to get off the mark uh, well immediately. Okay. As you said, and I'm getting to some of the questions now as well, that a lot of the media attention and understandably, the current public interest is around those cabinet and special right. advisor choices, which right. have all kinds of strum and drang about how people feel about them. Right. But underneath that, as you said, there's a very large number of right. appointments that are not even on the radar screen Correct. and may never be in terms Correct. of public attention. Right. What's that like for what's going on now? Are there position descriptions? How do uh, people apply for this? How does that work? All right. This is so a softball, as they say, So uh, <laughs> and, and le leading me to water here. So. Thank you. Um, so it's interesting, again, uh, you're 100% right. There's the tendency to focus on the shiny object, the leader of the cabinet agency, when in point of fact there are, are 4,000 positions that will ultimately be appointed, 1,100 Senate confirmed. And while the leaders matter a, a lot, um, they're by no means the whole story. And your question raises a, a, a really interesting um, hole that we discovered in our process. So there really are essentially 
this is going to be shocking, at least it's shocking to me, no position descriptions for any of these jobs. And so you think about it, 4,000 political appointments, and of those, I mean, the reality is that when you start um, separating them in appropriately, there are about 440 that are the core jobs, Senate-confirmed jobs, uh, that run the government. And so if, you know, those are the ones we're focused on, and there are no position descriptions for those. So what we've done is actually built out position descriptions, and we've had the benefit of uh, phenomenal talent from Hydric and Struggles, from the top tier uh, executive search firm, Pro Bono helping us actually construct these position descriptions. And we've got 160 plus uh, that are, are, are done. They're available on our website. If I haven't said this, I should have already, presidentialtransition.org. You know, tons of information there if you're interested in this. Uh, and we are providing them not only to the Trump transition team, but also to the Senate committees that are ultimately responsible for vetting and voting on these nominees. And it's another whole story here, but there are actually 17 Senate committees that have jurisdiction over the nominees. Each of them has their own process. Each of them has their own paperwork. Um, and one of the things we did, and when I say we, it really wasn't me. I've got colleagues who do fun, you know, just wonderful work. Uh, they, you know, in particular one person, went around and met with the majority and minority staff and pulled all, of each committee and pulled all this together. Um, but again, it gives you some sense of the complexity of the process and the lack of the infrastructure that's necessary to do this effectively. Because um, it really is the spoil system if you don't even know what kind of qualifications are necessary to do these jobs well. And so our goal really is to make this less about political theater and more about a job interview. So you've got to understand more about what's required to do these jobs effectively in order to accomplish that. So just to one-up this, there typically are no performance plans for any of these people either. And so, you know, there's all criticism about the career workforce, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine working in an organization where not just the top layer, but the second layer, the third layer, the fourth layer, and often the fifth layer is all people who, you know, were chosen without any sense about what the core qualifications are for the job. There are no performance plans. They're supposed to evaluate you, at least through the, your senior leadership. They have no idea how, you know, how your process works because it doesn't apply to them. That's really what we're dealing with here. And it is, I think, super important for people to understand that while I said earlier that Donald Trump is coming from the outside, he doesn't have the government understanding, that's true. And it's really important for him to understand the government. It's also true that the message that we need change is a right message when it comes to our government. We have phenomenal talent in our government, and they're being failed by their leaders and by the system around them, a system that has not kept up with the world around it. And so there is, um, I think, an opening for the kind of change that will make our country better, uh, in a, in, in, and that's what I believe everyone in this audience and anyone who ever listens to this ought to be focused on, which is how to take this energy constructively to create a better government that can serve all of us more effectively. Okay. Um, there's a set of questions that uh, I want to probe with you a little bit, which is every, in 2000, 2008, and now in 2016, we switched from one party to the yes. other. Yeah. Often in the vein of it's everything's broken, we fundamentally turn it upside down from a policy standpoint. Right. But they're also having to transition the leadership of all of those people. Right. So what's the, how does that work? How does the outgoing administration interact with the, trans, the president-elect's right. transition? And how is that going right now? Is right. So first off, I mean, it's a system we have. And as I said, we have, we've, gone, we've, we've taken some wax at changes and gotten three laws passed around transition and about 33 laws done more generally about government reform. Uh, and... But no one here should be satisfied with what we have right now. 4,000 appointees is nutty. You don't need that to effectively run the government uh, with a new president. And it creates all kinds of dysfunctionality, starting with the fact that new presidents believe that they can recreate a command and control system with the 4,000 people that they bring in rather than engaging the existing workforce to effectively run the organization. And almost everyone makes that mistake, then they realize that it's a mistake, and then they leave. And because they, they, they've run out of time. And, and as I've told you, the thing that always kills me is the speech that you hear all the time by the, 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 the political leader who is on their way out after 18 months or two years. And they say, I've never worked with a better group of people in my life. And 
that's their, that's their outgoing speech. It really needs to be their incoming speech. And, and there's an incredible amount of skepticism. And this is not a partisan statement. This is true for Democrats and Republicans, uh, even when you see, you know, same party leader. Um, so you're exactly right. And you said this, I think, at your front end, too. There are really three, three stakeholders directly involved in this, I mean, beyond the public and everything else. And that is, you got the people who are, who are going, the outgoing minister, you got the people who are staying, the career workforce, you got the people coming, who is the new president. And all three need to interact effectively in order for this transition process to work right. So I mentioned earlier that uh, Mike Levitt, you know, ran the gold standard process for uh, pre-election transition planning. Uh, George Bush uh, ran the gold standard outgoing transition process. And everyone I've ever spoken to, everyone, would say the same thing. Um, and uh, President Obama would say the same thing. And, and I think, and he made it a presidential priority on, on leaving. He, he, and he said, I want this to be the best outgoing transition ever. And he was motivated primarily by the real understanding about the national security imperative that exists around the transition. And he did not want to put our country at risk through a sloppy transition. Um, President Obama, has said, I want to make it even better. And in fact, the process in, in some respects has been better, uh, in part because they learned from what President Bush had done. So back to the learning system issue. And there are ways in which I think this administration has done a very strong job. Now, I don't know how many, you know, how, how much people keep up on the news of the day and political, whatever else it is. But I think one of the challenges that, that we've seen is that the Trump um, administration's landing teams, and there's a lot of lingo associated with this, but essentially they're the people in the transition that go into the agencies to understand it's sort of the due diligence process, to understand what's actually happening inside the agencies. And that process has been slow off the mark. Uh, and so the agencies themselves, I think, have been better prepared than ever before to share information with the incoming folk. Um, and, you know, there's still some time to go, but um, some time has been lost in doing that. Okay. <clears throat> if we're looking back and you pick the time frame, Valentine's Day, sometime enough out that's yeah. not the day after the inauguration, yes. and we're trying to look for things that you would say, these are good indicators of the transition's going yep. well, what's at the top of your list? Well, top of my list, again, I, I'm a people person. I believe personnel is policy. And so top of the list is how fast, number one, how fast do the right people and because it's not just about putting anybody in the job, get into the positions and how well prepared are they? And this is another element of the transition that is typically ignored. But in my view, it's always about who you pick and how you prepare somebody. I mean, those are the two critical elements to success. And every administration puts all of their energy into picking people, usually doesn't do that very well, and they do nothing around preparing their people to succeed. And so one of the things we've actually done is built a whole curriculum for new political appointees. Um, your question, how will we know when that they're doing a good or bad job? Um, I told you our markers on the personnel side are, you know, shortly after the inauguration, it doesn't have to be the day after or the two days after, but real soon afterwards, they ought to have their top 100 Senate confirmed people done. And they ought to have their White House in place. And the White House is easy or easier because they don't go through the confirmation process. It's hard in the sense that you have to know how to organize it effectively. So that would be the first marker. Our view is you should have your top 400 people, which is in fact your core leadership group in place by the August recess, uh, which is essentially 200 days into your administration. Uh, and that would be more than doubling you know, what the Obama team did, but fact of the matter is that's what we ought to see in order for the government to work effectively. That's on the personnel side. They ought to come into office with a management agenda. So everyone has a policy agenda, or in this case, you know, that's, that's you know, in development. But, but management agenda is, is a vital component to occur. Again, historically, administrations take their first year to two years to figure out that they need a management agenda, and by then they can't get anything done. So you got to walk in the door knowing what you're going to, how you're going to run the government effectively. You know, how are you going to actually treat it as an integrated enterprise? Um, uh, how are you going to actually get the career workforce to be more effective? There are lots of things that you need to be focused on. And again, uh, even on the career side, talent to me would be number one. 
So that would be a second area. And a third piece, which is vital, is to understand the landscape you're operating in and to begin to create the relationships you will need to effectively operate in the, in the public sector. And that includes, you know, first and foremost, uh, the career workforce. Because if you don't have uh, an understanding about how to motivate them, how to work effectively with them, how to garner their ideas, um, you're not going to get there. And second is Congress, because uh, you know, it's not just the legislation that they pass, but it's the confirmation authority they have. It's the oversight um, power that they have. And it's also the, you know, the budget um, that they provide or don't provide, which is now the norm. Um, so really creating the right relationship there is another piece uh, that any administration that wants any chance of succeeding in the, the difficult world we live in has got to do. Okay. Um, talk for a minute about what the risks of not doing this right are, not just kind of you didn't operate as well as you could. Right. But what, what are the things that if we don't get this right that we ought to be concerned about? So the risk that begins first and foremost with the national security risk. And, you know, we live in a world where there are a lot of uh, people and entities out there that want to do us harm and can do us harm in an asymmetrical way. And we've seen that. We uh, have, a, have a, you know, a sad history from, you know, 9-11 that, that demonstrated that. And uh, the truth is, and James Clapper, the director of national intelligence made the comment that in 53 years of doing intelligence work, he's never come close to seeing a world as scary and dangerous as the one we live in today. And he also describes transition as the point of maximum vulnerability. And if you look globally, uh, we have an unusual transition, given the nature of our government, the number of political appointees, separation of powers, that makes it harder. But you've seen attacks in transition contexts. And, uh, you know, uh, so that would be absolutely number one. And I do think that is the most fundamental responsibility of our government is to keep us safe. But it goes beyond that because our government is responsible for providing all kinds of services and uh, important support for, uh, for everybody in all kinds of different ways. And if you don't get transition right, you don't have effective leadership providing the help we need. So if you think about this, again, as I said earlier, this is about getting stuff done. This is about results for people. If you think about the Obama administration and the places where they have tripped up, they are almost entirely around management issues. And obviously the poster child on this is healthcare.gov, giant political battle, policy battle, and no one's thinking about, well, how do you make this stuff happen? And that's a huge mistake. If you think about the VA, in my view, largely a management issue. The General Services Administration, GSA, the scandal there, the IRS, I think that all of those were at heart management problems. And they come back to making sure you have the right people, well prepared, working well together, and with an effective strategy about how to run the government. Okay. That's enough to scare you. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, there is a popular perception that you'd be crazy to go work for government. And given the relatively low regard for government that was exacerbated in this campaign cycle and a divided electorate, how are we actually going to get people to engage on the issues that you're talking about? And why would anyone in their right mind actually want to go do this? Right. So I think you've actually identified two, two questions as I hear them. One of them is the direct question about do you want it yourself go into government? And then for the much, much, much larger population that will never go into government, you know, why should you care and what can you do about it? I mean, I think to my mind on all issues, those are the two fundamental questions. Why should you care and what can you do about it? But let's, let's start with the first piece, which is, you know, should people, you know, pursue government service jobs and, and particularly if they are, um, you know, not happy with the, the election outcome. And I'm looking at Scott Kohler came in here, who is a, a great public servant himself from the Obama administration. And, you know, he's going to give a better answer than me, but I'm going to like tell you a little bit what I think here, which is I don't know anybody who has gone into government who doesn't believe that their time in government was the most rewarding and meaningful experience that they had in their career. And 
it is hard. It's hard to get in. It's hard to get stuff done. It's, you know, not necessarily well viewed by those around you. And yet, it, you know, it is the most powerful opportunity to make a difference in the world. And I think fundamentally, most people, and certainly most people I like, you know, that's, that, that's or, or like to be around, they care about making a difference. What's sad is that in today's world, they don't often think about government service as the fulfillment mechanism for that. And there are, as I said earlier, lots of reasons for people to have complaints about government. My attitude, though, is complain all the way and understand it, but do something about it. And do something about it might mean to serve. And even if you don't believe that we have the right president, do you really want a government that's not just 4,000 political appointees, but in effect is 2 million political appointees? Do you want a government staffed entirely by people that only agree with the, you know, the, 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 the president? The president doesn't own our government. The president is there for four years. We own the government, and we have to take responsibility for it. The reason why the spoil system only is 4,000 people and not 2 million is that over 100 years ago, there was a president that was assassinated by a would-be job seeker. There were riots for people concerned about our civil service. And I think the public has fallen asleep on this issue, and to their detriment, to our detriment. We need to care about our government. It is, it is, it, it's not Washington. And it's, it's not, we were sitting here in California and everyone's like, it's over there. It's not true. Actually, 85% of the government workforce is in, outside of DC and it touches everything that we do of consequence. And as a result, um, I think, A, there's great value in going into government and B, I think people in this audience and beyond need to figure out ways that they can weigh in on trying to make our government better. And it's, as I said earlier, it's kind of great space because instead of fighting with people, you can actually fight to get good stuff done. And I think that's also a very attractive element to this. Um, we're a tiny nonprofit at the Partnership for Public Service, and we're trying to do something way above our weight class. The only way we succeed is if we get others, other partners to live up by our name involved and engaged. And my view is it requires one of our, we got five main uh, levers of change. The last one is building stakeholder support for an effective government. Right now, one of the reasons why our government works poorly is you have short-term political leaders who are not aligned with the long-term needs of the organizations they run. Average 18 months, two years in office, you're rewarded for crisis management and policy development, not for actually bringing good talent in, not for making the organizations run better. Now, what that means beyond we should change the system is that we need business, we need nonprofits, we need universities, we need all these associations who care about a policy issue associated with government to take some piece of their advocacy and make it not about the policy, but make it about the execution and make it about building capacity in our government. So anyway, okay, I great. hope I answered the question. No, 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 that, was really yeah, that was great. Yeah. That was great. Um, All right. A call to action, too. So I want to ask you a question about call to action. So um, this has been going on for a while, this challenge. It's yes. not like this just happened Getting worse. in the last six yes. years. Um, talk a little bit about what the, not the political appointees, because right. those are in and out, right. but the workforce themselves. Right. What, what does that population look like, and how, how uh, important is that we engage in that topic in addition to the political appointees? Great. Um, you know, it's, you gave me a good roadmap here for all along here, so I will do my best to, 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 to meet it. Um, so let me start by saying there are phenomenal people in government doing awesome things. And anyone who doesn't believe me should go to our website at servicetoamericamedals.org, where we identify the best innovators. It's a premier awards program for federal employees, and it's, it's unbelievable. So you've got the CNN Heroes program, whatever it is. These folks are 10,000 times better. I mean, they are unbelievable. So like the guy who er helped eradicate polio in India. You tell me somebody on the Heroes program eradicated polio in India? <laughs> Not so much. But it gives a sense of scale that is possible. Uh, you know, the one that usually, it was one of our first years that we did this, that got the standing ovation, the woman who started the Do Not Call Registry. How many, like, 300 million <laughs> Americans don't have to take? Pretty amazing. I'm serious, though. This is, you know, the, 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 the scientist that really is the founder of immunotherapy. You know, for, I mean, this is unbelievable stuff. 
All that said, the federal workforce is in trouble. And as I said before, it's about the system and the leadership. And, uh, you know, some numbers, just to, to, to add beyond the stories. Federal workforce today is basically 6% under the age of 30. And in my organization, it's a, you know, federal government's a knowledge-based organization. This is super important because people sometimes compare on salaries, stuff like that. You have to understand what the government does, and it's really about um, professional talent. Uh, my organization, over 50% under the 30. McKinsey, you know, same thing. Any sort of equivalent organization, you're talking 50% versus 6%. Um, worst example. Uh, so we're in, you know, Bay Area, technology, you know, et cetera. Federal government spends $90 billion on technology every year. Almost 80% of that is spent on operations and maintenance. And it's basically keeping old systems alive. Systems that are 50 years plus old. Uh, one of the major systems involved in our nuclear arsenal is like using floppy disks. Um, what's the workforce that is you know, responsible for that? Uh, in, the, in the federal government, there are more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 30 doing IT. And so, 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 so when you hear the suggestion, freeze the federal workforce, like freeze hiring the federal workforce, ask yourself, is this what I want to freeze? And the answer is, of course not. This is, you know, that's not the answer. Freezing it is not the answer. And so, um, so why does this exist? And, and it begins with the fact that the leadership in government doesn't own talent. So whenever I've had someone who is a effective leader from uh, the private sector come to the government, one of the first things they notice is that no one owns talent. And that's just bizarre to them. It's like, how can that be? And again, it comes back to the short-term leaders who are not incentive to this, the fact that there aren't good performance uh, measurements in, in that so the short-term leaders can hide from the impact they have on the organizations that they run and in my view also Congress's dereliction of duty in managing the executive branch effectively. Uh, so you have a group of, of, of talented people who um, spend very long careers in government, uh, who don't move around, there's very little mobility. Uh, so there's a cohort of top executives, career executives in government. Uh, only 8% of them move agencies once they get this, to this level. Um, they're largely technical experts who get promoted up because of their technical expertise and they're not invested in. Talent is largely seen as a cost in the executive branch in the, in the, on the civilian side rather than as an asset. And, and again, these are things that uh, we, we have to change. We have to change if we're gonna want the outcomes that we expect from our government. And they include obviously the national security issues as well as the, um, uh, you know, the food we, we eat, the drugs we get, all those different things. And again, I want to come back to the point of the government we have worked very well uh, in the past. It has just not kept up with current demand. And that's a very, very big problem. One last thing on the, on the civil service, and that is to understand size. Because again, there's often an effort to say, well, there's too many you know, federal workers. And it's worth noting that the federal workforce today is the same size as it was in the Kennedy administration. Uh, there are 2 million federal civil servants. That's what they had then. Um, there are now over 100 million more Americans. And the federal government is doing a lot more than it did in the Kennedy administration. So a good example would be TSA. So it has is, it is effectively shrunk a whole lot. And I'm not arguing for the same footprint and size. What I am saying is the wrong real metric. Uh, and, and, and it's dangerous to, to do control by headcount rather than by, by impact and, and by budget. Okay. My, my um, favorite anecdote on this is that the private sector spends more on coffee per employee every year than the public sector spends on training per and, employee. And, and, and uh, we, we do pay, we spend too much on coffee, but still not enough on, <laughs> on, on, on development too, right. since I don't drink coffee. So I can, okay, okay like, good. Okay. Yeah. So um, I want to, uh, in the last few minutes we have here, talk a little bit about the um, opportunities and the way to think about this as we're sitting in California. Yeah. But before I do that, I need to do a quick um, radio reminder that you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California's radio program. Our guest is Max Steyer, the founding president and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service. 
and we're discussing the transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. You can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, find video of club programs on the club's YouTube channel, and visit us on Facebook and Twitter. So with that public service announcement, if we're back into public service again. We're sitting in California. What should Californians think about this in a way that they can engage? And is there something that you would encourage Californians to think about that they might be able to do to help with the things that you're talking about? So I think uh, California, is, last I look, is still part of the United States of America. Uh, so the answer is it absolutely does need to engage um, and has a lot at stake here. And so, uh, you know, interesting, I said earlier that 85% of the federal workforce is outside of D.C. California is, in fact, one of the largest center for, for actually employees themselves. But again, it, it sets the stage for all kinds of issues, again, um, both national security as well as quality of life concerns that are pretty fundamental. So as I said earlier, you gotta answer the two questions, why should you care and what can you do about it? You can't hide, not in today's world. It's, it's, it's not, you know, whether it's you know, climate change or Zika, whatever else it might be, it, you know, national borders, state borders are not respected by challenge. And so you can't hide behind the California state border and say, you know, I'm safe, I don't need to worry about anybody else out there. The federal government is relevant to us all no matter where you live in this country and even the folks that live globally. So you gotta care. And we have one government. It's, 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 our, our, it's our tool for collective action as a society. Uh, so people need to care. The what you can do about it, uh, I'm still figuring out lots of options and there are plenty of them out there. I mentioned earlier, I think most everybody is associated with some kind of professional or other uh, you know, um, larger organization entity that is involved in some way or form or fashion in trying to push an agenda. And my point to them would be, make sure your agenda is not just about the policy, but also about its execution. So that would be one way. And that's a way of multiplying your own individual strength is by looking for those organizational vehicles to make a difference. Second place that would be meaningful, obviously one that you raised yourself, would be I think, uh, you know, no matter where you are in your career, um, thinking about public service, thinking about, when I say public service, government service, which used to be synonymous and now not so much, um, is a phenomenal opportunity. And you don't have to go to Washington, D.C. There are you know, federal jobs here uh, in, in, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, across the, you know, across the board in California. There, there are opportunities to volunteer. The Park Service is one of the best volunteer experiences that I'm aware of and that people can do. So that would be another area, of, I think, of opportunity for folks. Um, I think it matters that people here actually spend the time to learn a little bit more about the stories that I was talking about, the Sammies. Part of the challenge we face in government is that there's a whole infrastructure that exists to find problems and nothing to actually identify bright spots and good things. And I've never seen an organization get better if all you do is kick it. It doesn't happen. Same thing with kids. Like, you know, so it's like, like uh, you got it, you got it, you got it. You know, again, it's the positive reinforcement message. It's, it's true for organizations because organizations are made up of people. And I don't think I mentioned this, but one of the programs we started is what we call the best places to work rankings. We got a law passed that requires every agency to conduct an annual employee survey. And then we rank the agencies uh, against themselves over time, against their peer agencies and against the, the private sector. And if, um, it's, it's, it, it, is, it has then led to leaders paying attention to management. But if you look at the data, what it will show is that only 44% of federal employees believe that good work is recognized. And if you looked at a reasonable private sector benchmark, that'd be at 67%. That's a very big delta. So one of the things that people ought to be doing is identifying, learning about the good things, sharing the good things, sharing the good things as a way of encouraging more good to come and to solve some of the problems. Um, but you know, I'm also interested in other ideas that people might have about things that we can do to engage them uh, because this all ought to be an all-in proposition for everybody. Okay. You, you had mentioned that this uh, need is huge and that there's an yes. opportunity for people um, to actually serve in different yes. ways. Um, as a, a one more anecdote, you know that I helped create this organization called Fuse Corps, which takes mid-career professionals. Place. Yep to serve in the government. We placed 30 fellows. We had 1,000 applicants That's for phenomenal. those 30 fellows. Yeah. And we probably would have placed 200 of them if there were the opportunities. Right. And so if we have really talented people who would like to serve, 
can they and how do they do that? Right. Well, look, I think it's a great point, and, and I was remiss in not saying that obviously as a nonprofit, you know, we need resources. That's another way people can help because um, we can't do what we do without help, financial help from people. Uh, you raise a very important point because the tendency for a lot of people is to think about, A, how to get young people in the government. It's like, how do you inspire a new generation to serve? And that's all good. But as you suggest, whether you're mid-career or second career, the government can be a great place for you. When we first started as an organization, that's where we, that was our, our, our source point of activity. What we quickly learned, though, was that that getting people interested in government service was actually important but a secondary issue that the federal government wasn't able to take advantage of the talent that was already interested in coming in. And that's why more of our energy is spent on trying to help the government do a better job than trying to get more people interested in government. Now, that said, um, my, 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 my view about careers is you swim against the current. Like, if you really want to do something meaningful, you don't do the easiest thing. And Getting into the federal government is not easy, but if you're committed to it, persistence is an undervalued virtue. Um, you can make it happen, and it is worth it because your experience will be unparalleled if you're smart about it because you don't just go anywhere. You want to find, you know, again, the good boss and all those other things that are pretty essential. Uh, and you know, we have a resource um, called Go Government where we have a bunch of information about how to you know, navigate the, the federal hiring system. Uh, you know, the terminology and everything else like that. Uh, it's still a case, even in the internet age, that human relationships are really important. You know, finding people who are inside, who can help you understand when job openings are occurring, understand the process, you know, that kind of networking, I think, is pretty vital. Uh, and finding the people where you're already connected. I mean, whether it's your school or some other geographic uh, connection, I think that's a lot of the way that, you know, that jobs are found more generally, and it's also true in the federal government. But the biggest point of advice would be know it's difficult and know it's worthwhile. Okay, terrific. We've um, unfortunately reached that time in our program where we have time for one last question. Um, That's because I'm long-winded. No, 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 yeah. no. It's a good time flies yeah. when you're talking about the federal government? challenging issues. <laughs> so, um, so um, Max, you have a, an audience both here in the room and probably listening who believe that government should and can be better. Right. What, what closing words do you have of optimism for peace, people about can this be done and, and how are you feeling as you wake up in the morning and feel like, am I making a difference? So, I mean, my starting point is I don't think we have a choice. Like, I think that this is really important to, to start. I, I'm a believer that, it's surely what I tell my kids, which is, you know, the cards are dealt, so we got to make the best with the cards we got. And I'm not trying to sugarcoat. I think there are some huge challenges, and it is not an easy road forward, but it's our only road forward. And so uh, I do think that what is attractive about this area is not only can you get bipartisan agreement uh, to focus on these issues, but um, that there really are some very concrete, real things that could be changed. I mean, I discussed just on the transition side, position descriptions or performance plans, these are not hard. I mean, they, you know, doing them really well, yeah, not so easy. But to do them at all, come on, you know, not so difficult. And there's a lot of those low-hanging fruit opportunities. And there are plenty more that I don't know about. I mean, this has been a learning exercise for me as well. So I am highly optimistic about the ability to make, I mean, it's going to sound bad, but things are so bad that there's a lot of opportunity to make it better, you know, so there really is, uh, you know, some, some pretty uh, significant things that can be done. And it starts from the fact so bad that, that basically no one cares about this. And that doesn't have to be, and it's, that's pretty easy to, you know, for people to change if they just take ownership of it. So I am, I'm by nature an optimist, and I think we have to be, because I think we have to understand it's not just about us, it's about our kids, it's about the world we want to live in, and I think fundamentally, this is a, a battle about making sure we create the world we want. And you can't do that with your nonprofit alone. You can't do that as an individual. You, you, you need, you know, again, that collective resource that's, that's our government. That's fantastic. And um, for all of you who are in the room and, and listening on the radio, you should know that 
Max is doing this with a relatively small not-for-profit and trying to turn this massive behemoth called the federal government, and he's making a huge difference. And we all ought to be really uh, proud and thankful that you're doing it and join you in that journey to tell, try and help make the government better. Well, thank you very much. So, so again, our thanks to uh, Max Dyer, the founding president and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service. We'd also like to thank our audiences here on the radio, on TV, and on the internet. I'm Lenny Mendoza, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>